Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. And in fact, the message today is called Hearing the Cries Through the Noise. So as a church, we need to be careful that we're not getting caught up in the noise, that we're not hearing the people around us who need Jesus. And there's a lot of needs in our world. There's a lot of people who need Jesus. And we pick up in 16. Before this was the big meeting in Antioch over, or in Jerusalem over uh, whether new believers who were not circumcised yet needed to be circumcised. That was decided that that was not necessary for salvation. And so Paul, Silas, and Barnabas, and John Mark, they would go their separate ways and multiply and share the news to everyone and continue to preach the gospel and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're picking up on the missionary journey. This is the second missionary journey. We finished the first mission, missionary journey last time I was here. Now we're picking up on the second missionary journey of Paul. I wanna show you a map as well on the screen of this journey. It's pretty big. Uh, he starts on the right in Antioch, and in the purple you see Cilicia, and so he'll travel through Tarsus, Cilicia, and he'll go to Derby, and he'll go to Lystra and Iconium, and we're going to read in the first few verses that area. Then he's going to pass up through Asia, through Messia, uh, yeah, Messia, and then he's going to camp out at Troas in the uh, seaport there, just on the left side of Messia, um, and from there, he continues to travel all the way back down to Jerusalem and then back up to Antioch for his next, uh, his third missionary journey. So we're covering second missionary journey for the next couple of chapters. It's pretty neat. A lot of traveling. No, no cars, no airplanes, donkeys, boats, horses, goats. No, not goats. We'll go with donkeys. <laughs> and so let's get right into it here. Verse one, Paul went first to Derby and then to Lystra where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. And Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. And in deference to the Jews of the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem, referring to Acts 15. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. I want to stop there because I was scratching my head as soon as I read this. Because do you see the conflict a little bit here? In Acts 15, it was decided that the, the Greeks and the Gentiles who were being saved didn't need to be circumcised like the Jews to be considered true believers. And all of a sudden you have, you have Paul wanting Timothy to be circumcised in deference to the Jews, in consideration to the Jews. What is going on here? Well, it's not a conflict. It's not about salvation that he's uh, wanting Timothy to be circumcised. It's because his dad was Greek, his mother was Jew. And he knew that if he, if he was going to preach to Jews in this next journey, he wanted to limit how many distracting arguments there was going to be and, and go right through the noise and just preach the gospel. So this was strictly a missional strategy. This was a str uh, strategic move to get rid of this distraction. The Jews, the Jews would know uh, about Timothy. It's, he's well known. His dad was well known, apparently, according to our scripture. And they would have questions about his dad being Greek and his mom being Jewish. And so to listen to his testimony, to listen to Timothy or his testimony would become an issue to the Jews who were not saved yet if he was not circumcised. And so out of a strategic move to get right through all that and just focus on the gospel, Paul asked for Timothy to be circumcised and Timothy agrees to it. And that's the only reason why. And how, how wild is that? You read one chapter, you don't need to worry about it. You read this chapter, Paul wants him to, and it was mainly because of a missional thing, still agreeing with Acts 15. More importantly though, Timothy was well thought of in that community. Timothy had a great reputation in that community. What was it referring to? Referring to his integrity, his spiritual growth, and even his ministry potential. 
Paul saw something in Timothy, and so did the other people in these communities, that he was probably going to be a minister or serve with Paul. And Paul was so impressed that he invites Timothy to join him on the mission trip. How cool was that? Complete opposite difference with John Mark. He, he, was, he was like, John Mark can go with Barnabas, and I'll take Silas. So Silas is with him on this journey, and, and now he sees Timothy. And I want to talk about that for a moment. Because I see a valuable lesson right there. How important is it that we are spiritually ready at all times in case someone calls upon us for help? How important is it that we are ready spiritually, that we have integrity, that we have potential to minister for God? And I believe that all Christians should be ready at all times. Now, obviously, Paul saw something beyond the part-time. He saw a full-time missionary, a full-time pastor. Timothy ends up being a pastor in the church of Ephesus, and that's why there's two letters to Timothy, First and Second Timothy. So he begins, or he grows and he matures, but Paul brings him under as an apprentice and teaches him the ways of ministry. And I thought about that too, that we need to be ready to mentor and develop the next generation that we need to be there and mentor and disciple every generation, amen? But we all should be ready. We all should live a life of integrity. Because even if we don't go on a full-time missions trip or do full-time ministry, there's someone in our community that needs Jesus today. There's someone around us who could use the care of God and the love of God. And I wanna speak to our young generation today. All generations matter. And this matters even for the older generation. But I want to speak to our young generation. There's this lie out there that says, oh, you can wait till you get serious about God and go to church. Go through college, live your life, do what you want to do at college, you know, uh, get, get married. And then when you have kids, maybe you'll start going to church. It's a subtle one and it's out there and I've heard it too many times. But I want to encourage you with even, even if you never heard that or never experienced that thinking, I want to encourage you with this. Right now, your integrity matters as a young person. Right now, your relationship with God matters. This was a young man, a young adult that, was, had, that had a life of integrity and that was living such a godly life that the community and a missionary who's done amazing things saw potential in him. And I just want to speak to the young ladies and the young men here. Your life is not wasted in Christ. It's worth the time you spend in Jesus, in the word, in prayer. Your integrity matters now. How you live will matter how you treat your future spouse as well. What you pour into your life matters. Becoming a godly person now will help you be a godly person when you age and when you grow up. How many, how many of us who are, I'm, I'm 40 now. How many of us can say amen to that? Amen now. Of course, it's never too late if you're 40 years old or older, whatever it may be, and you want to get your life right with God. He's always there. We heard the word today. He's waiting for us to turn to him. But I'm just saying right now, don't copy the patterns of this world, the Bible says. Just because all the young people are doing all this stuff doesn't mean you have to be. You could be a remnant separate from everyone else. You can be different and you can be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's my testimony. My testimony is I followed Jesus as a young boy from the age of 12 on. I was committed to Jesus and I didn't get into all the craziness of this world. And God kept me for such a time as this. And he's keeping you for such a time as this. So don't wait till later. Right now, your journey with God matters. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And, and God wants to develop you and help you become whoever he wants you to become. Even more than what you want to become. And he will give you the desires of your heart as you delight in him, as you have a relationship with him. He will give you brand new desires. He will change your heart and mind. It's going to be a beautiful journey. We're going to move forward into the next part of the scripture. Verse 6 says this. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bith Bithynia. 
But again, the spirit of Jesus, by the way, the only time it's ever, the Holy Spirit is ever mentioned in the New Testament in this way is in this verse. The spirit of Jesus, the same spirit that was in Christ, the Holy Spirit. But again, the spirit of Jesus or the Holy Spirit did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. How interesting is that? Like God cares about all people being saved, amen? And he doesn't want Paul or Silas or Timothy to stop in Asia or Mysia or any place in that region, which is huge. I want to, I want to show you the map again. Surely there are lost people in this Gentile Roman Greek society. There's Asia there in the pink. Surely, and this is first century Asia, which is much different than today. But no, God stops him from going there to any place twice. And you scratch your head on that one too. All I can tell you is this, God is sovereign and his timing is perfect. Just to make you get, you know, not to be so concerned or worried, it's the third journey, third missionary journey where Paul goes to Asia. So God still cares about those who live in that area. But God's timing was not yet for that area for the gospel to be preached. So he is parked at Troas right there on the left side of Mysia. And he's at a seaport and he's waiting for God's next direction or call or move to go forward. And where should I go, God, is, is really where the team is at and they're waiting. And we don't know why God would stop them for sure, but we just have to trust the Lord. How would he do that? Let me, let me just teach you something here too. Uh, perhaps Silas gave them a prophetic word similar to what we heard today, but a prophetic word that was warning them not to go to those areas. Maybe that's why. Maybe there were some malfunctions with the camels and the donkeys. And every time they went that way, they, they were, you know, kind of acting crazy and didn't want to go that way or they, they couldn't settle down. Perhaps it was an inner conflict with the Lord. Every time they wanted to pursue a community in that area, there, was, there wasn't peace and the Lord stopped them. I think it could have been any one of those. I believe it was probably more prophetic that the Lord spoke through the body of Christ because that's the pattern in the, in the book of Acts and that he warned them not to go there at this time. And so they didn't. And it's where he's, he's by the sea. Anyone ever take a vacation and hang out by the ocean? Doesn't it seem like God speaks to you a little bit more over there or something like that? It's because you calm down, you take a vacation from life and you open your ears to whatever God has to say. Well, he's taking a nap or he's sleeping, it's nighttime. And this is what happens next. Let's go to verse nine. That night, Paul had a vision, which means dream here. So he had a vision in his dream. A man from Macedonia and the northern Greece, in northern Greece, was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Some versions say begging. Some may even say crying. The idea is he's crying out for help. The idea is begging and pleading for help. Come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. This brings the question up is how do we know the Holy Spirit is leading? How can we tell? How can we tell he's stopping us? Well, you might get a word. You might have things not work out. Whatever big decision you might be making in life. For them, this was a big decision. A lot of traveling involved. And so they, they stopped to seek the Lord. I want to encourage you with this. If you don't feel a peace about doing something or moving forward in your life, uh, a peace or a conflict about a situation that has to do with work, family, whatever it may be, you, you apply it. If there's not a peace, then stop and pray, amen? And don't just stop and pray, but also ask other people to pray for guidance because the Lord will give a word to people, but then after that, ask for confirmation that that word was from the Lord and not just someone's opinion, especially if it's your mom or dad's, okay? <laughs> Or maybe a friend who's biased and wants you to do whatever you want to do. Ask the Lord for confirmation. Wait on him. Spend time in the word. Spend time fasting from food. And spend time in the word praying and worshiping. And, and get rid of the noise all around you. And spend time listening to the Lord. And then follow what God gives you. And if you don't get any kind of answer. By the way, I've got answers from reading the Bible. 
and God would use a scripture or a story to give me the answer I was looking for and I would have an immense peace about it. Even this sermon, I was seeking the Lord that way and God had to give me peace on Tuesday afternoon. So when we do that, when we make decisions, let God lead you by his spirit. There's something powerful when it's spirit initiated rather than human initiated. Because if it's spirit initiated, the Holy Spirit is with you. If it's not spirit initiated, it may just be you. And it may just be you going this way. And God's like, that's not exactly what I wanted you to do. So we want God with us, right? Amen. And I want to do what God wants. And sometimes we got to hit the brakes and hang out by the seaport, so to say, and wait on the Lord. Well, right away that night, he gets a dream. God has a knack for communicating to us in dreams or through people. I want to tell you a story. I didn't share this back in the fall, winter time when I preached on end times, when the sermon series was called Discerning the Times. I waited actually for a while because I didn't want to just preach that based off of the attacks on Israel on October 7th. And I sought the Lord on what to do. It was already in my heart. I actually was going to title the sermon series a year ago or way, way, a year before this series. I'm not surprised because I'm not surprised at what's going on in our world. The Bible's told us all this is coming. Amen. On October 7th, Israel was attacked and obviously, you know, everyone's praying and there's the terrorist attack on them and all these things. Now there's the conflict. But two days later, in the middle of the night, between 3 and 4 a.m., I was dreaming and I saw Jesus coming from the sky, coming back to earth. And it was so real and I felt immense peace and joy about it, but it was so real, I woke up suddenly and quickly and kind of gasped for air and sat up off my bed. Well, I didn't know this, but my wife was awake. And uh, my wife said, are you okay? And I didn't tell her the complete truth. I told her that, no, I'm good. I just need to use the restroom. And I didn't want to startle her. And I didn't want her to have like anxiety, you know, because it was already a tense time, wasn't it? And so I didn't want to build up her anxiety and she can't go back to sleep. I know her. She wants to sleep. She loves her sleep. So do I. And so, you know, I didn't even want to, I didn't want to keep her up. And so I decided to just say, I need to go to the bathroom but I was startled by this, the realism of this dream. And the next day we were walking as we usually do. And I said, I wanna tell you the truth. I, I didn't tell you everything last night. Um, I saw Jesus coming from the sky, coming down to earth. And it was his return for us. And she said, Ryan, I had the same exact dream last night. And I don't know how, how much, you know, I felt everything go up my spine. The tingling of everything, my skin, you know, just the hairs on my body jumped because I did not expect that. We're both sleeping and we both have a vision in our dream of Jesus returning soon. And we didn't talk about it until a day later. The Lord was communicating to us what we all feel and see in our world right now. He is coming soon. We don't know the day or hour. I will never stand up here and tell you it's this date at this time because that's a lie. That's deception. All we know is, and what I felt was, is that Jesus wanted me to make sure I focus on what matters most for my life, my family, and the church, and to focus on reaching the lost and making disciples and strengthening the church. And because of that, it did help me go and do my series on discerning the times. So God was directing me to move forward with my series and he used my wife's dream as well as a confirmation to my dream. Amen. Amen. Pay attention to your dreams. Amen. <laughs> now I'm not Daniel. So, you know, I don't have interpretation of dreams all the time. I rarely do. Um, so don't, I wouldn't say you should call me necessarily and you have them. But I will say this, God has told me about things that people are going through and I, was, I had to reach out to them and tell them or they, maybe they've had something going on in their life and God's given me words to, to confirm in their life and it ended up being true. 
And God can do that through you too. That's why I'm saying stop and pray and let the Lord lead you. Amen. And let him use the church body as well to help you. It's better to be spirit initiated and spirit led than to be human uh, led in our work. Even, even when it comes to reaching the lost. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to a takeaway right now and just say this. Calvary could do a lot of ministries. We could do a ton of stuff. But you know what we're going to do? We're only going to do what the spirit of God leads us to do. The single mom's day out this weekend, that was born of the spirit, not born of man's ideas. The Holy Spirit led us to do that. Other churches may do other things that we don't do. We're not in the comparison game. We're going to do what the Holy Spirit calls us to do. All right? And what he calls us not to do. Because he also wants us to focus on what really matters right now. And that's make disciples. Help the lost be saved. And then teach them to go reach the lost. Amen? If you're looking for like a purpose in life right now, if you're looking for like, what do I do next as a Christian? That's it. Be discipled, be taught. Right now you're learning, you're being discipled. And go reach the lost. Go help the lost come to know Christ. Be spirit initiated, spirit led to those who need Jesus. And when they give their life to Christ, teach them to obey, teach them to follow Jesus. Let's get them water baptized and all those things. By the way, Last year, we had 80, 81 water baptisms. We're on the way, we're on the verge of breaking that record this year already because God is moving so much through the people of God, through, through this church. Isn't that awesome? God is good. So let me get to the last portion of our scripture. They decide to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Verse 11 says, we boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of, wow, that's a tough one, <laughs> Samoth race. And the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of that district in Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. Philippi being the book of Philippians, by the way, a letter to the Philippians church. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. So now she's showing hospitality and being a good host. So they were meant to go to Macedonia for such a time as this to find a woman that owns a business selling purple cloth, very rare, who, who believes in God, but doesn't know about Jesus. So she's been influenced by the local Jews to fear God, to worship God, to do good things, but she does not yet know Jesus Christ. And because Paul goes there and preaches the gospel, her heart is open and she responds by accepting what is said because responsibility is still on us to accept. But her heart is open by the gospel and she wants to get baptized. And not only does Lydia get baptized, but her entire household gets baptized. They all get saved, meaning any, any uh, family, relatives, anyone who worked with her home, uh, she may have had servants at this time, whatever it may be, employees, the whole household came to hear Paul and Timothy, Silas, and by the way, even Luke is here now. He's using the single plural form, we. So he's speaking from first person plural form here that they are all together. So now Luke has joined this mission trip, which is pretty neat. And he's, he's witnessing this firsthand, what's going on, all right? And she gave, she gave her life to Christ, her whole family does. And I just wanna just throw out something to you. She was probably well off. She was probably wealthy because of this. And just notice this, that even if you're wealthy, you still need Jesus. Until we have Jesus, we're all in poverty spiritually. We're empty, we need him, we're bankrupt. There's no answer for our sin, we need Jesus. You may have all the things working out well for you. You could have a job, you could have your spouse, you could have nice cars, nice home, the American dream, but you still lack eternal life or salvation from sin and salvation for you unless you have Jesus Christ. 
You need Jesus. I need Jesus. No matter what I have materially, we need him. Amen? Amen. I thought of the scripture of Romans chapter 10. It says this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You see, God sent Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke to Lydia's home for such a time as this to start a church in Philippi, which would become the church that Paul writes to Philippians, the letter Philippians, to speak on joy and to help give them joy because later on they would face persecution for their beliefs. And God wanted to plant a church here at this time and to reach this family and these people and it was successful. And we see earlier too that the church grew in number and strengthened by the work of ministry. I wanna encourage you that in the middle of all of what's going on in our world, all the noise, all this stuff, do you know that God sees you right now? This is where that message tied into the sermon. He cares about you. He's asking you to come to him so he can help you. He won't force you to come to him He will open up your heart like he did today through this word or through that word. He will open up your heart, but you still must respond to him. Your heart must respond. He cares about you. He sees you. You know what song came to my mind? His eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow. He sees what you're going through. If he cares about the birds and the lilies of the field, he certainly cares for you. Amen. And church, that's why we exist. I'm going to close with these statements. We exist to hear the cries through the noise of this world and respond. God will call you to be his agent of ministry. Without being a full-time pastor, you'll be a part-time minister for him, whatever it may be, however you want to look at it. We are meant to love and to help and to speak truth and to share the gospel. We are meant to bring comfort to those in need all around us. And we must be ready like Timothy was. Young people, again, we must be spiritually ready because through the noise of everything coming at you right now, there's only one thing that matters and that's your relationship with Jesus Christ and his will for your life. The will for God, uh, God's will for our church is to hear the cries and answer the call. Let's not be distracted. Let's, not, let's be careful that we're not distracted by all that's going on in the world, that we forget our purpose for being here as a church. We also exist to raise up and mentor the next generation. We want to see the Timothys and the Tabithas and the Tianas and the Thomases and all the other names out here in the world. We want to see them believe in Jesus Christ and grow up to be disciples of Christ. Amen. Amen. We exist to do spirit-initiated work in our state nation, and around the world. Thank you so much for your support of our missionaries. Thank you for our, your, the support of our missionary last week. They were so blown away by the love here, the, the time together we had, and the gifts and the offerings that you gave him. It was a great offering. Because of your offering, we're able to support them for four years. It's amazing. Amazing. The Lord, the Lord led them to this church last week. It was spirit initiated and God knew who needed to be here to hear that message. It was such a good message. I want to show you some pictures real quick because this is the stuff I get to see that you don't necessarily get to see before we sing a song together. These are things that are going on over the past six months to a year, just a few pictures. You know, as a pastor, you, you may not see all these things, but I, as a pastor, get to see this. So I want to keep this in front of you, but this is discipleship that was happening every Wednesday night in our, in our front lobby. You can keep going in the next picture too. This is our discipleship journey, helping believers be discipled to become disciple makers. So we're teaching them the basics of Christianity and what they need to know to help people follow Jesus. We had 25 people and out of the 25, 10 of them were not water baptized yet. So we got to water baptize them. Check this next picture out. 
I'm sorry, that's, that's discipleship of our, our teenagers. I snuck into the, to the youth group for the men's, or the boys group, and Pastor Brandon is discipling the next Timothys in our church. How cool is that? You can keep doing the next one. This is a, we baptized Shane here. He was going through our discipleship journey. He's given his life to Christ. He's been walking with the Lord and we've been helping him, teaching him. Him and his wife both got baptized this day. By the way, the next, the two weeks later, we baptized 29 more people here in our sanctuary. Check out this picture. This, this couple, elderly couple, had not been baptized yet, been married for decades. Beautiful testimony. Tears, tears in the tank. Don't even go to our church, baptize them. Because it's all about one church, amen? Amen. How about kids camp? Thank you for your investment in kids camp. Thank you for your giving. You don't realize that your giving helps us do everything you're seeing on these, on these screens. Go to the next picture. These are the kids writing things down for God and to God. Keep going to the next picture. They had their camp shirts on together, praying at the altar because we're praying for the next girls and boys that are going to change the world. Keep going. One of my favorite pictures. The love, not me. The, the love. <laughs> that was bad timing. Yeah. The two boys together as friends, worshiping together. How cool was that? So why don't we stand together as we sing? If you need Jesus to change your life today, his arms are open wide. We want to pray with you. Our prayer team will be here today to hang out with you and pray with you. God called us already. He is so ready to pour out his help and his blessings upon us if we would just humble ourselves and see that we need him to help us. If you've been going through some things, you need to know today his eye is on you. He cares for you. His loving eyes, his caring eyes, even his holy eyes. Listen, he sees everything we do and yet he still wants us to come to him. He sees the wrong, he sees the good, but what, he's, he, what he wants to see is us to come to him so he can change us from the inside out. He loves you still. Isn't it amazing he still loves us? It's amazing grace. So if you need him more, the altars are open even starting right now. If you need more of him, he is ready to come and to fill you and to help you. If you need prayer for salvation, our team will stay here to pray with you. We wanna help you with that process. I'm gonna close a prayer after we sing this song. It's been a long time since I've sang this song. And many of us don't know it and many of us may need a refresher, but let's do our best to sing and declare this to God and for ourselves. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We believe that, God. Thank you, Lord, we believe that. Let me close us in prayer. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that through the noise, through the struggles, you hear us. And Lord, you're watching right now this world. And you know what matters most right now is eternity. Because this is just, just a mist. It won't be long before this finite world is over and then the infinite world begins. So Lord, I pray that we would measure our days, as your word says, to be careful how we live and to be careful to love you and love those around us and help them come to know you. God, we pray for the next generation that you would raise them up, Lord, and that we would be the generation, God, that would help. We thank you, God, for the giving and the sowing into the work here at our church. Lord, we pray you just multiply our gifts. Lord, I pray you would use us to be spirit-led, God, and may we listen to your Holy Spirit to take us and to lead us to who we're supposed to minister to. And God, I pray these words that you gave me this week, Lord, may we ever be ever growing and spiritually ready at all times to respond and minister to those around us. May our spiritual hearts and ears be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. May we tune our busy lives to the patient orchestration of God's sovereign hand. May we have the courage to do new and hard things for you, Lord. And may we draw grace from the eternal well, Jesus Christ, 
to show compassion to those who don't know or live the truth. God, we ask all these things. And Lord, for your salvation to come in this place or those watching online as well, for hearts to be open for your help and for us to be courageous enough to admit we need you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Thank you for the comfort we're feeling today, the peace that we're feeling today in your presence. All glory goes to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.